welcome everyone. I'll, I'll be today your, your host, the MC, and welcome to the Inner Source Commons June community call. Uh, this is the place where our community gets to hear real life Inner Source experiences and discuss the topics that matter. Today's theme, as a reminder, is DevOps and Inner Source, and we are delighted to welcome our guest speakers, Pei Wan from Comcast and Steph Egan and Tom Sattler from the BBC on today's call. Um, it's always great to know a little bit about who's, in, who's on the call, who, where, where are you coming from? So while I'm giving this intro, please do type in the chat your name, company, and to learn about you, how long have you been practicing Inner Source? So it would be good to know uh, each other. So how it works. We are having a full hour of uh, inner source discussion. Typically, this is split into two main areas. The first 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so is uh, about our uh, speakers, where they will be sharing their insights and experiences on the topic on inner source and DevOps today. And this part, as a reminder, will be recorded. And, re and the recording of this will be shared on our YouTube channel. So there is an inner source YouTube channel. You should go there. In the second half of the community call, uh, we will hold a discussion under Chatham House rule. As a reminder here, uh, Chatham House rule is, uh, means that you can freely use the information received, but you cannot state who was uh, the, the, the speaker or the affiliation, who said what. So you cannot use the identity of that person, either the, the identity or the affiliation, remember. Um, uh, this discussion uh, is also recorded, but uh, uh, the recording will not be served given the Chatham House rule. However, we are recording this because we'd like to uh, create, make some takeaways, docs, and resources afterwards. So just uh, that, that you are aware of this. Um, now, I would like, as Claire mentioned before, to uh, to ask every, everyone to uh, to go on mute and turn off your camera, but not the main, the first speakers. And for this, I'd like to, to bring on stage uh, Steph Egan and Tom Sattler. Please turn on your microphone and, and, and your camera. Steph Egan is a principal software engineer at the BBC who works with a large variety of teams across the iPlayer and Sounds products to help them with their delivery practices. Steph also provides product support for a development team who are focused on helping other teams be better and move faster. That's the motto. They are building up a catalog of tools which have been built from the ground up to, the, to be inner source. And Tom Sattler is a software engineer, engineering team lead for BBC, A Player, and Sounds. Working in the connected TV space, he has advocated for supporting open source projects, including the BBC's TV application layer and big screen player, and lead on collaboration between teams. Today, uh, this very first talk will take around 20 minutes. The title is Inner Source and DevOps, like chips and gravy, uh, with Steph and Tom Sandler. And the, the abstract is uh, a, a quick summary, chips and gravy work extremely well together. I have to try this, I have to say, just like DevOps and Inner Source. In this session, Steph and Tom will discuss their experiences in the BBC. Topics will include what they mean by DevOps and using inner source with DevOps tooling. They will also share how DevOps and inner source help each other. So stage is yours. Great, thank you, Daniel. I'll uh, share my screen. So you should be able to see my slides. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the intro. Um, as, as Daniel says, uh, chips and gravy work really well together. Um, anyone up here in the north of England will, will tell you. So uh, if you ever visit the north of England, this is what you should be expecting. Um, and uh, of course, the two key ingredients in poutine as well, a Canadian dish that's sweeping the globe. So it's, uh, it's not just the north of England. Um, and yeah, uh, like, like Daniel said in the intro, we believe that um, much like chips and gravy, inner sauce and DevOps work extremely well together. But first, what do we mean by DevOps? Wikipedia says, DevOps is a set of practices that combines software development, dev, and IT operations, ops. It aims to shorten the system's development lifecycle and provide continuous delivery with high quality software. For us at the BBC, DevOps is the practices that we had to take on when we moved to the cloud. Suddenly our teams had the freedom, and more importantly, the responsibility to control not just our applications, but also the infrastructure that they were built on. And we've spent the last five years working out what that means. 
teams manage their own CI CD infrastructure, how their applications are deployed, what they're deployed on, and they support their applications out of hours. What resulted was hundreds of ways of building and deploying applications. My team, Orion, was created in response to that. How do we help those teams move faster and have better engineering practices overall? We're focused on delivery engineering and a part of a group of support teams who help all areas of DevOps. You could maybe call us site reliability engineering if you put us all together. Um, Orion has been around for almost two years now. We use a couple of techniques to help teams in our clearance sounds. First, we build tooling that we can see solves problems that lots of different teams are having. And secondly, our subject matter experts work directly with teams in a consulting capacity to help them achieve their goals. This can result in running workshops, pairing alongside teams, sharing knowledge, and asking them hard questions about their processes and practices. We focused on helping teams understand, measure, and impact the four key metrics. If you haven't seen those before, they came out of a large amount of research done by DevOps Research and Assessment, or DORA. Uh, you can read up about them in the State of DevOps reports uh, and the Accelerate book, which is pictured here, which I would highly recommend. So those four key metrics are deployment frequency, so how often you're deploying to production, change lead time, the time it takes to get a commit into that production environment, mean time to recovery, so how long it takes you to recover from an incident, and failure rates, what percentage of your changes cause a failure. So these measures will help you determine high performing, how high performing your team is. Orion is there to support over 30 teams in iPlayer and Sounds and have influenced the way these teams talk about their throughput and availability. But their tooling is also used across the whole organization. The reason this was so successful, I believe, is because of two key principles that Orion has held from the beginning. The first one makes services as easy to use and integrate with as possible. This for us means removing as many barriers to entry as possible and often creating more work for ourselves so other teams don't have to do it. One of our most popular services we provide is called Proxy. And it's so simple. It just provides some authentication on top of S3. So people can make internal tooling really easily. But everyone thinks it's amazing simply because they don't have to talk to us to install it. The second thing is we aim to merge every PR that comes our way. Our tools have been built, been built from the ground up with an expectation of inner source. The way that we encourage that in a very disparate organization is mostly word of mouth and clear documentation. This builds up a reputation that we do care about what effort teams put in, and we're looking to support more teams overall. This is not the expectation that's our, in our organization at the moment, so people find this very refreshing. Um, so, uh, as a customer of Orion, I've seen the benefit of these DevOps tools being built in a source from the ground up. Um, and I've also seen the other side because my team maintains a shared continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, so, we're going to talk to you about uh, using in a source DevOps tools from both the, um, the, the user and the provider point of view. Uh, so, talking about some of Orion's tooling first, um, one tool is the post mortem tracker. Um, and having DevOps tools like this in a source encourages buy-in for using it across iPlayer and Sounds. It reduces the risk of teams making their own tooling. Um, there's also this general point about DevOps tools and internal software in general, anything that isn't client-facing. It seems to be easier to in a source it because of its perceived lower risk, um, because it's not client-facing. And whilst that's helpful to in a source, I think it is a bit risky to have that point of view about DevOps tools, because um, it's still important that you can release and monitor your software. Uh, but that's perhaps a, a topic for a different day. But having tools like this in a source means that we can contribute features to make them work better for us. Uh, for instance, I made an in source contribution to list postmortems chronologically, with the latest at the top as more recent postmortems uh, are generally more relevant. Uh, I may also have had a slightly ulterior motive because the uh, the first ever incident 
that resulted in a post-mortem was one that I caused single-handedly, and I was maybe a little bit sick of seeing that at the top of the list. Uh, another tool from Orion is the deployment tracker. Uh, this is a system which tracks iPlayer and Sound software deployments, uh, and the data is used for calculating uh, deployment frequency and lead time, two of the, the four key metrics that Steph talked about. Um, but this data can be used for other things than that. Um, and there was an inner source contribution to deployment tracker to integrate it with our monitoring systems so that graphs can include annotations showing what component was deployed in what environment at what time. Um, so in this example, we've got the, the launch time of our TV apps. Um, and by using the deployment annotations, we can easily see if a release has had an impact on the, on the launch speeds. So having this underlying, uh, having this understanding of how our software is behaving in production is exactly the type of things that DevOps is all about. And this is also a great example of inner source where that contribution scales to all the teams that are using it. So moving on to my experience uh, on the maintainer side, um, just for a bit of context, I work on the connected TV devices, iPlayer and Sounds applications, uh, connected TV devices being smart TV, set-top boxes, games consoles, and other streamer devices. Um, and these TV apps are composed of many shared libraries and are maintained by a number of teams with responsibilities split by functionality. Um, so my team develop and maintain the initial application launch and the user sign in. Uh, and also the shared CI CD pipeline um, for the applications themselves and the supporting libraries. And having this single shared pipeline means that the apps and the libraries are being truly continuously integrated and continuously deployed. Um, and all teams working on the TV client therefore take end-to-end -end ownership of their code, um, which is in line with DevOps principles. Uh, and coming back to the deployment tracker example uh, with the release annotations, the shared pipelines deployment tracker integration means that all users of the shared pipeline get this for free. Uh, again, a classic inner source benefit. Um, and the other side of inner source, which we all like to talk about, is how you allowing contributions can add value that the core team perhaps wouldn't have added. Uh, and this is some work in progress example where the security guild uh, is integrating some application security automated testing into the pipeline realistically this isn't something that my team would have uh, would have ever got around to doing so again classic inner source example of where it adds value uh, so to summarize um having having an inner source pipeline means that the product development teams can contribute to the infrastructure that releases their code as I say, perfectly in line with DevOps principles. There's less demand on the pipeline owner's time, so my team. Um, it increases the reuse of DevOps infrastructure for common problems in the TV application space, which means that teams can spend more time on product development. Any features added, such as the deployment tracker integration, benefit all adopters, and you get contributions like the application security one and that otherwise would never have been done. So why should you inner source your DevOps? Firstly, DevOps is hard. Thinking about your application and its infrastructure and how you deploy it, it requires a lot of knowledge and experience to get it right. And in a two pizza sized team, it just isn't doable sometimes. Building tools that any team can use will mean that they need to think a little less about these areas and can really accelerate them in their real focus which is building great applications for our audiences. Secondly, DevOps is a common problem. As I mentioned earlier, our hundreds of ways of deploying had a lot of crossover and teams were experiencing very similar problems. If you solve the problem once and let everyone benefit, yes, it can often be harder to do, but it helps those teams who would never have had the time to do that in the first place and help them really flourish. It brings everyone up to the same level. As Tom showed earlier, because we had everyone's deployment data in one place in Deployment Tracker, uh, we can start presenting that data in a new way on our monitoring graphs, basically free for everyone. You could say this is why centralized ops teams 
uh, existed in the first place. But hopefully this gives teams the benefit of DevOps, autonomy, responsibility, and ownership. Thirdly, DevOps is personal. Although there are lots of common problems, not one team will work the same way or should work the same way. The tools that my team built have to deal with a lot of completely different ways of working. Calculating the change lead time for one team is not quite the same as calculating it for another. InnerSource allows us to be open and honest about the figures that we produce and also allows teams to make things more accurate themselves if they need to or cover specific use cases that they have. One example of this was a contribution to add time, time selection to our metric viewing website. We'd written this feature off due to time constraints, but what one team really wanted to analyze their data over long periods of time. And now everyone benefits from that feature. So on the other hand, or the opposite of uh, what Steph was saying, why should you DevOps your inner source? Uh, now I talked before about our shared CID, CICD pipeline uh, and the benefits of it being in a source, but now I want to talk about how that DevOps pipeline actually helps in a source the TV client. Um, so as a reminder, uh, our TV apps are maintained by multiple teams with responsibilities shared by functional area. Functional area. So my team's the user sign in. Um, I play a playback is owned by another team. Sounds homepage by a third. So. Um, to give a bit of history of our journey to this pipeline, um, we've gone through a fairly typical DevOps journey, moving from quarterly releases with um, on-premise infrastructure managed by a separate ops team to many releases a day deployed to our self-managed cloud infrastructure. But towards, towards the end of this journey, we started to have trouble with scale. So we were continuously delivering to a test environment and able to release to production on demand but our infrastructure wasn't able to keep up with this demand and the optional nature of deploying to production meant that teams would often block each other's releases. <clears throat> and I think this is very much a deterrent to making inner source contributions. If it's a struggle to get your own silo released, surely it's gonna be 10 times harder to get a contribution into someone else's released. And of course, if there's no guarantee that your contribution will ever get released, why wouldn't you just work around it within your own silo? So in order to solve these issues, we made a plan to move to true continuous delivery through to live, uh, including um, replacing our old infrastructure with code build and code pipeline so that it could scale, um, which is where we're up to now, like I was saying before. Um, and you can see on this graph of deployment frequency, we went from five to 15 deployments per week to nearly 40 per week once we were automatically deploying to live. And there are a few different practices we had to implement to get there. Uh, we use branch-based development and discourage long-lived branches. Uh, and we find this strikes the balance between being able to work autonomously on your branch, but because they're always short-lived, uh, we are also practicing continuous integration. And um, again, talking about continuous integration, we have pipelines for each open pull request. Um, and this is, this is giving us high confidence uh, on our work in progress. And this is doubly important when your work in progress is an inner source contribution. Uh, and another key part uh, of this puzzle is having automated release notes. Um, this means that teams can work autonomously within their ownership area, but their work is automatically visible to other teams via the release notes without any real additional overhead. Uh, and also make sure that contributors include relevant information in their inner source contributions. This two-way visibility is very helpful when working inner source. Automated releases are enabled via structured versioning, uh, labels on the pull requests, and a pull request template. Uh, and this enables our uh, releasing tool to uh, determine the version number, populate the release notes from the pull request body, uh, signal whether the release includes any audience facing changes, uh, and also link to the JIRA ticket. All this enables the transparency and visibility requirements of working in a source. Um, in terms of code reviews, that's enforced by our GitHub setup with code owners um, and also the, the checks via the pull request pipeline. So um, 
So the code owners means that the trusted committers get notified and the pull request can't be merged until they've approved it. Uh, you can't merge unless the branch is up to date with master and has passed all the automated tests. That's the uh, continuous delivery requirement being fulfilled. Um, and you can't merge unless the, the version and user facing changing labels are present on the pull request um, so that the automated release notes can be generated correctly. And uh, I think what's really interesting from an inner source point of view is that this pull request process is how you work on the TV client, regardless of whether you're making an inner source contribution or working in your own ownership area. Uh, the main difference really is just being who does the code review. Um, so this makes contrib contributing to TV client, whether it's inner source or not, pretty seamless, uh, as well as having all the visibility benefits of the automated release notes I talked about before. Uh, and this seems to have been a great success from both the DevOps and an inner source point of view. Uh, one of the ways we measured this was through the deployment frequency and lead time. Again, coming back to the DevOps key metrics. Um, but these metrics are pertinent for inner source too, and suggests that inner source doesn't slow down your development, which is, I think, what some of the naysayers say. And if anything, it actually speeds it up. So to summarize why you should DevOps your inner source, it means that all teams can have visibility of each other's work. It means that shared code is continuously integrated and deployed for all consumers. DevOps enables the inner source contributions to scale, which does have a cost. We've definitely seen this in our AWS builds, but we believe it's a worthwhile investment. Uh, and finally, and probably most importantly, DevOps gives confidence to potential adopters and contributors to the inner source project. I hope we've shown that both DevOps and inner source result in higher quality, better documented and better supported code. And I hope you leave today looking to inner source your DevOps by solving common problems once and self-serving your release software and thinking maybe to DevOps your inner source to make contributions seamless and have confidence as a stability in production. Before we finish, I just wanted to go over um, some of the questions that came up while we were writing this presentation, maybe some things to think about. Um, we found writing this presentation really hard. We went in uh, with this expectation that we would be able to sort of contrast the two areas, but what we found was that they really merged a lot more than we were expecting. Uh, it was really hard to draw boundaries between the two. Um, the other thing was uh, DevOps is now considered best practice mostly, um, but perhaps wasn't a few years ago, 2016 was uh, when the DevOps handbook came out. And we were sort of thinking, should inner source be considered best practice? Should this be at the same level that, that DevOps has seen in the community as a way of getting um, great quality applications and code? And that's it. Thank you for listening. Stop my screen share. This has been a really great presentation. For sure, you will have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, although uh, we'll we'll go with them after our next speaker, who is uh, Fei Wan. And Fei Wan is a senior principal architect in Comcast Software Strategy and Transformation Organization. She collaborates with the large developer community inside Comcast to accelerate software delivery performance transformation, particularly in the area of cloud technologies. She is the community architect and maintainer of an inner source project that has a growing list of reusable uh, Comcast community maintained Terraform modules for deploying common Comcast application architectures. And she also serves on Comcast Inner Source Guild, which guides teams through best inner source practices. She's fascinated by inner source patterns. Great community, by the way, if you have the chance to join us, and has collaborated with the Patterns Working Group on a mind map for easy navigation of the inner source commons patterns. Uh, the title of today's talk by Faye is Terraform Community Modules, a DevOps inner source project at Comcast. Um, uh, this this, this is Terraform community modules are reusable and Comcast community maintain Terraform modules for deploying many common, uh, common Comcast application architectures. They enable easy adoption of cloud technologies and foster innovation across teams in Comcast. Um, so Faye, all the stage is yours. Thank you, Daniel.
Hello, everyone. My name is Fei Wan. I'm a senior principal architect in Comcast. Today, I'll be talking about the experiences of a DevOps inner source project we have, which is called the Terraform Community Modules. This is an inner source project my teammates and I started about one and a half year ago. The goal for this project is to enable Comcast teams to be able to spin up their application infrastructure uh, in a few minutes instead of spending weeks or months learning how to implement that. There are a lot of jargons we've been throwing around. So before we talk about the project, let's first go through what are the terms. First, what is DevOps? DevOps is a combination of practices and tools that enable organization to deliver software much faster and more reliably. DevOps teams are responsible for the entire software development cycle from um, software development to deployment and operation. The DevOps teams, they use practices and tools to automate the processes that traditionally were manual or slow. That's how they're able to make the business delivery to be faster and better. Let's take example of a common business need. Your company is doing very well. They want to expand to a different region to grow the business. And you've been asked to expand your software deployment footprint to that new region. How long would it take you to complete that task? Is it quarters, weeks, or minutes? In the age when you have to deal with spare metal, it's easily quarters time. You have to procure all those spare metal machines, got them shipped and wired in the data center. Lots of things need to be done before the application team can get their software up and running there. And then comes the time when your team could create a few tickets to get those virtual machines. And then the DevOps teams might be able to manually configure those virtual machines to get the software up and running. That would take a few weeks. Compared with the quarter's time dealing with spare metal, it is big progress. And today, with the cloud provider out there and the more advanced automation tools, it is actually possible to expand into a new region within a few minutes. You might wonder, how is that possible? What is the secret thing that enable a team to expand the software de deployment footprint in just a few minutes? The practice is called infrastructure as code. It is an essential DevOps practice. It actually revolutionized the DevOps team way to bring the application infrastructure online. What it does is it uses a combination of automation and code implementation for the infrastructure to enable teams to set up or tear down their application infrastructure based on their need. This makes it possible to deliver an application infrastructure in just a few minutes. With the right infrastructure as code practices, it's actually possible to get all three benefits. You could do things faster, better, and cheaper. You could build in the resilience and the security into your infrastructure as code to make it better. You could plug in the different parameters, allowing team to do different tests to find out what are the best uh, computation resource that fits their need to make it cheaper. And with the same infrastructure as code, you can reproduce that environment in different places as you need, therefore deliver much faster. This is a pretty exciting practice. Many Comcast teams embraced this practice and went on the journey to learn it and apply it to their daily jobs. However, in an enterprise environment, we realize there are some challenges for the enterprise to get the benefits from these practices. The first challenge we see is the steep learning curve. It takes a lot of learning and experiences to get things right. 
how can you be comfortable that you're not going to break your production environment when you apply a change to it? How do that is something takes years of experience to gain that best practices. And there are many teams in a big enterprise company. So we found there are excellent expertise in certain pockets of the company. However, there are many more teams within the company that are still learning this and haven't been able to get the benefit of that. And the last, if you look at how many new releases coming out from the different cloud provider, the different automation tool, it is an amazing number, it's insane. It's really hard to keep up with this constant technology update. And that's how we came up with this uh, Terraform community modules idea as a DevOps inner source project. If you think about a cloud architecture diagram, it lays out all the different cloud resources you need to pull together to get to application running on that. Terraform module is the type of um, source, source code that implements the different cloud resources to allow a team to spin up the cloud architecture in just a few minutes. So the first thing we do is we would cultivate a production quality solution from a single team. The team has spent weeks or even months thinking about how do they build in the resilience? How do they build in the security? To, so that this application infrastructure meets the production need. And then we convert that to a community module to make sure there are parameters that are visible for the teams to tune to their different need. Maybe some teams just need a small computation resource for their small scale web application. Maybe another team needs a much bigger computation resource or they have different auto scaling need. Once this is turned into a community module, it is available for all teams across the organization to use that. And they could benefit from this production quality infrastructure without having to build one from scratch. Our mission is to make the right thing easy to do. Besides DevOps, you might have also heard about DevSecOps with the additional consideration of security and DevSecFinOps with the additional trade-off to think about financial means, how to make sure you get the business value without having huge cloud cost. It is a long list of things that need to get right for a business to get the benefit. And we want to make those right things easy to do instead of everyone learning all of those and implement all of them. We took a three steps approach for this inner source project, innovation, community, and transformation. For an inner source project to have a cross team collaboration, innovation culture is important. That's how we can break the silos from teams to get the engineers across different organizations to collaborate together. For this project, we have set some strategic direction to help the teams across Comcast knowing what is the big direction we're heading towards to make the software delivery to be faster, better, and cheaper. As an enterprise, it is also important to make sure we have the right governance there so that innovation still com uh, conform to the compliance need we have. So we build a light governance with the guardrail to ensure innovation can happen, but then it's also within the bound of the governance. The last thing is the great innovation culture in Comcast. We have something called Lab Weeks. It happens three times a year. During a Lab Week, any engineer or anyone in Comcast can come to pitch their idea about something innovation. And then they recruit members from different organizations to work together for a week. At the end of the week, they will present what they have implemented or what they have learned at a science fair. 
that is how the Terraform community modules was started. My teammates and I started pitching that idea to the Comcast teams about coming together, building the Terraform modules for the common application infrastructure to help the team adopting the cloud infrastructure. We got a few engineers coming together. We worked building, uh, releasing a few modules as the MVP, and we worked together on a contribution framework. That's how it was born. After that, we started doing more community building. Our open source program office helped us marketing this inner source project to broader community within Comcast. There are many open source practitioners within Comcast. They already are familiar with the practices of open source. It is pretty straightforward for them to bring those open source practices to the inner source project. We also organize meetups. It is great to be able to get to know each other, connect face with the code you're working together on. That's where we also learn the practices and the challenges different teams tackle. It is also important to make sure you recognize the contribution to the inner source projects. We use Slack, email, and newsletter to recognize the contributions from the community member and let their manager know what kind of contribution they have made and what benefit it could bring to the adopters of those uh, Terraform modules. The contributions we got is actually more than just a code. From the teams who have done many years of infrastructure as code DevOps practices, we learned the challenges to run production quality environment through team collaboration. We turned those team practices into community practices so that more teams in Comcast can benefit from what they have learned and came up with on maintaining a robust infrastructure and evol evol evolving that infrastructure with new technology. We also got contribution of new Terraform modules from the team that has built those for their production environment. And they think the other teams could benefit from this because that was a big challenge they face. And usually those are those could be common challenges faced by the other teams. And for the teams who adopt the community modules recently, they actually might find the modules could use some update to add additional features from the cloud provider to provide more features, or it could be updated to support the latest Terraform version. That's how we're able to evolve the modules to keep up with the technology update. So the transformation results we can see is with the Terraform community modules, teams are able to get accelerated on the cloud and DevOps adoption. If you start from scratch, learning everything from internet tutorial or taking some training course, it could easily take you months just to get comfortable with using cloud and DevOps practices. Terraform community module was able to accelerate that. Teams is able to use the modules directly so that they can actually see and experiment the application infrastructure they want to try. So this reduces time to learn and allows the team to deliver their application infrastructure much faster because they don't have to build everything from scratch. And through the collaboration across organization, we get engineers with different expertise and different experiences they bring a faster and better innovation through this community modules. Here are some tips that have helped our inner source project. The one thing we learned is for inner source project, community is super important. In my opinion, it is even more important than the code itself, because that's how you bring the community together to learn from each other and understand the challenges each other faces. And the second tip is just as any inner source or open source project, it is important to make the contribution experience to be simple. 
For DevOps project, there are many tools involved instead of requiring the contributors to installing all the right tools on their machine. We came up with some community container that has all the tools set up already. So it's easy to contribute by just using this community container. And the last tip is it's super important for the maintainer to be able to understand what's the implication for a PR. For infrastructure as code, the continuous integration for the PR is very important because it is not reasonable to expect the maintainers to manually test those PRs. So we invested in a continuous integration framework that enabled the, the maintainers to see the automated testing of PR and they can only approve after they see all the tests have passed. So in summary, I see DevOps inner source projects as a great way to transform big organization. They allow us to accelerate the cloud transformation, connect the teams through community, and innovate with industry trends. This is my contact information. Feel free to reach out if you have any question. And join us on the inner source common Slack. There's a virtual coffee buddies that pair us randomly by pair so that we can chat and connect. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Faye. This is, this is indeed a really uh, great reminder. So there is this Slack channel. Please feel free to, to join the Slack channel and then you will uh, you can contact to Steph, Tom, and, and Faye. So by the way, thank you, Steph, Tom, and Faye for your time today. Um, remember that we'll be uh, sharing our takeaways from this session with the community shortly, and you can, you can uh, find this in our LinkedIn. And uh, our next community call will be on the 6th of July. Michael Graf and Guilherme de Lagustin from SAP will be joining us to talk about the topic of inner source and discoverability. So we hope to see you there all.